Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 8, A World to Come. It was by chance Johnny saw the lights ruby coach treadling slowly down Orange Street, heading for Milton and a little country air. The bright sun glittered on the gold eye, rising on the coach door on the black sheen of the strong horses. He half wanted to stop the coach. Don't you go to Milton, Miss Light. They are lying in wait for you out there. He could not bear to think of her tossed about by rough men riding on a rail. He could, sorry, ridden on a rail. He could see her profile through the window. Scylla sat facing her. Asana, as befitted her higher station in the household, sat next to Miss Light. Only Asana was staring about, observing the lower classes, milling about in the street. She looked straight at Johnny, and he at her. Neither gave any sign of recognition. It was not by chance Johnny sat, saw... It was not by chance Johnny next saw that ruby coach. Late in August, word was spread through Boston that Merchant Light had got it, or was going to get it, out in Milton. If driven from their country house, there was but one safe refuge for them, behind the British lines in Boston. Toward evening, Johnny began to hang out about the gate. The farm carts carrying food and fuel to Boston were still coming in over the mud flats, connecting the town with the mainland. These, the British guard at the gate, nearly 200 men were kept stationed there night and day, let pass, but when night fe really fell, the gates were closed, and most of the soldiers returned to the barracks. There were a few sentries on duty and a handful of men with the corporal and the guardhouse. Johnny settled down to wait. He had been dozing, but woke quickly, hearing the sentries yell and the corporal commanding the gates to be opened. Then coming closer through the still summer night, the clatter of hoofs, the rumble of a coach was a sickening, hair-rousing howl, the howling of a human wolf pack. The corporal had not had time to get his tunic on, but he recognized the situation. Another of his majesty's loyal supporters fleeing to Boston with the mob at its heels. Torches only, he was crying to his men. No muskets, death to any man who fires. The unarmed soldiers ran out to meet the coach with great flaring torches in their hands. The mob already had stopped and was drifting back from whence it came. Through the canopy of shaking orange light and through the smell of burning pitch black horses, whitened with lather and dragging a heavy ruby coach, slowly crawled to the safety of the gates. The gates shut behind them. The coach seemed disabled. The horses were almost spent. A torch flared up onto the coachman's face. It was twisted with fear. Mr. Light yourself, sir, the young corporal was saying as he opened the door of the coach. Let me assist you, sir. You've lost a wheel off your coach. Please to come into the guardhouse while you wait for another vehicle. Mr. Light helped by the corporal, but even more by Miss Lafina did crawl from the coach. He tried to smile, but his lips drew back, drew back from long yellow teeth. Johnny had seen the identical expression on the face of a dead woodchuck. He was a desperately sick man. Lafina's face showed no fear, only concern over her father's condition. Now she was telling the corporal that a doctor must be fetched, and she wanted Dr. Warren. I know he's a rebel, but go get him for me. He's the best doctor we have in town, and Papa, Papa must have the best. Her father safely inside the guardhouse, Miss Lafina came into the street a moment, gazing blankly at the disabled coach and at the men carrying from it into the guardhouse, such of their most precious possessions as they had had time to rescue from Milton. For the first time, Johnny saw Scylla. She had been sitting on the box with the coachman. Now she went to Miss Light. Somehow, she said, the silver got left behind. The silver? Miss Light did not seem to be able to take in anything but her father's sickness. You told me to pack it up, but I just as I be had begun, we heard the mob coming, and then Mr. Light had fit. Oh yes, I remember, all that silver. Well, she was standing there in the street, watching for the sight of Dr. Warren's chase. It sounded very good and quiet, was snuggled close to her, her hand in that of her patroness. Oh, never mind, child, she said, with absent-minded kindness. At least we are all safe, and if only Papa is well, and... I'm going back to Milton, miss, to get that silver before the riffraff steal it. Most likely they already have it. Most likely they have it already. Dr. Warren's chase was drawn up beside the guardhouse. He was getting out. Miss Lafina had no more thought of her silver. Johnny went up to Scylla. Look, Syl, he said. I'm here. It was so mixed up at the end, the girl seemed to be trying to explain her error more to herself than to Johnny. Mr. Light turned purple and fell. The mob was getting closer. It came early. Then Mrs. Bessie warned us. Mrs. Bessie? Yes, yeah, she found out some way in the village. Johnny liked the old woman, all the better that in the end she had been unable to see a considerate master, whom she had served for thirty years, a young woman whom she had taken care of since she was a baby. Humiliated, tossed about, torn by a mom, Sam Adams might respect her for the less for this weakness. 
Johnny respected her the more. Johnny, I've got to get back to Milton. I'm going to save that silver. It was my fault. But Miss Lafina didn't seem to care. She didn't scold you. If she had, I wouldn't go. She thinks it has been stolen already. No, after smashing the gates and some windows, the mob left the house to chase us. We didn't dare leave by the front drive. We started out through the haying fields, but they heard us and caught up, and we were getting away all right until just on the neck a wheel came off the coach. It was terrible. I've got to go back, though, and now. I'll go with you, but looks like we'll need a horse and a chase. It's seven miles. Dr. Warren was standing on the guardhouse steps, telling Miss Light that her father must be allowed to finish the night out on the bed the soldiers had made for up for him. He was not to be moved, and never again must he be so upset over anything. From now on, as long as he lived, as she loved him, he was never to be angered or worried. The handsome girl was nodding, promising these impossible things. She went back to her father, still clutching a Santa by the hand, and Johnny went to the doctor. Obviously, Dr. Warren did not want to lend his horse and chase. He did not care what happened to the light silver, but he was a generous man. He let Johnny have his rig and also wrote him a pass which would prevent any molestation from the Whig mobs and told Sulla to get a similar pass from the British soldiers. Then they would be safe from either side. So at last the gates once more swung slowly, heavenly, heavily in. Beyond was darkness and a dreary waste of land and sea. The doctor's little rabbit-eared mare flung herself forward. It would not take such a fast pace or long to get to Milton. Although once or twice the light chase slurred as it caught in great ruts, made by the disabled light coach, there was no other sign of the late violence. The mob was utterly gone. It was not until they reached Roxbury that they knew the time the village clock struck two. Thus far they had not met only sorry, thus far they had not met one single human being. But here were a few turbulent fellows hanging about and indoor, and in Milton itself they were signaled to stop by a group whose faces they did not they did they never did see. But Dr. Warren's chase and horse were recognized. Go ahead, Warren. Good luck, Warren. They went up the steep road from Milton. It was here Mr. Light had his country seat. Then Johnny got out, struck tender, and light, lighted the lantern he had found in the chase. He stood by the entrance gates. Yes, Scylla was right. They had smashed the arms carved upon the gates. The poor people of Milton had had enough of that rising eye. Johnny wasn't sure, but he had as well. He walked ahead and Scylla drove the horse. Thus half seen and in the dark, things did not look too bad. Scylla had a key to the back door which showed hatchet marks but was not bro broken down. They went into the dining room and from the lantern, Scylla lit the candles and the two candelabra, candelabra on the tw table, 20 candles in all and the room filled with light. Fear had overcome the lights as they had sat down to eat, bread broken and never eaten. The roast of beef with Yorkshire pudding sticking and the cold gravy. A bowl of salad was still, was still fresh. Wine in the slender goblets. Already the great house did not seem to have been abandoned for a few hours, only but, only but for years. It was as if a witchcraft had been worked upon it. Johnny saw that Scylla had started to get the silver together. Where's Mrs. Bessie? She left earlier than we did in a farm cart, but you know, she'll be all right. Scylla went to work packing the silver, and she built up a little fire on the kitchen hearth so she might have hot water to wash the dishes. Neat by nature, she would leave the house tidy. Johnny took the la lantern he had left on the kitchen table and walked through the silent house. He could see that every window on the lower floor had been broken, but not one had entered. He went upstairs, Lafinia's room, and strewed about it things he had never seen before. Stays, kerchiefs, patch boxes, ribbons, fripperies. It smelled faintly of lavender. He went to Mr. Light's room. The great four poster soared to the ceiling. A damask, a damask dressing gown and Mr. Light's best wig on a wig rest. Off the big chamber and one step down was a smaller room designed as a dressing room. Mr. Light seemingly had used this as an office. Here was his desk and above it a painting of his favorite ship, the Unicorn. And here, judging by the tipped over chair and the rumpled rugs, Mr. Light had had his all but fatal fit. It had caught him as he had been packing his more important papers, papers he wished no one to see. Johnny picked up what looked like a leather-bound book. It had been hollowed out, turned into a box, and a bookcase no one would suspect it. He glanced at the papers within. Every one of them, he saw, Sam Adams would be thankful to get. These he put in his pocket. Other books were scattered on the floor. Johnny picked up a heavy Bible, hoping that this, too, would prove to be a box. He put it in... He put it on the desk and opened it. 
there were sheets of paper between the Old and New Testaments. Here a man might write his ge genealogy. So, the first Jonathan Light had been born in Kent in 16-something, 16, 16 and he had married a Matilda something, had come to Boston and had four sons and three daughters, and they, all seven, had sons and daughters, and so on. Now he was coming to the generation in which he might expect to find his own mother. Here, indeed, was Merchant Light himself and his daughter Lafinia, the two sons who had drowned at Guadalupe, the girls dead in infancy. He even found that Aunt Bert, who had stayed on at Boston with her own servant. He found one Lafinia Light after another, one married an Endicott, and one an Otis. Neither was the right age for his mother. Scratched out in such a way he had first thought it was a mere decoration on the elaborately written page. There was another name. It was Lafinia Light. He held the lantern closer, born 1740, married to Dr. Charles Latour, both of whom had died in, of plague in Marseille shortly before his own birth. His mother had told him he had been born in France and that his father had died before his own birth. But why Dr. Charles Latour, and why had his mother's name been scratched off the family record? But nevertheless, this was the spot, the very spot, where he might hang his own few meager leaves to the light tree. Although, in his daydream, he had often pictured himself a nephew, grandnephew, or even a grandson of Merchant Light, he had never once believed the relationship was that close. Now he checked over the generations. His grandfather, Roger Light, died now for 20 years a builder, and builder of this very house, had been the younger brother of Jonathan Light. Johnny himself was the merchant's grandnephew. He took his knife from his pocket and cut the pages from the family Bible. Sometime they might be of use to him. Sylla was calling him. She wanted him to help her carry the heavy boxes and hampers of silver to the chase. On the one side, board as yet unpacked, stood the four standing cups of the lights. Which one is yours, Johnny? He looked them over carefully. Only a silversmith could have told them apart. The base of one had been ever so little bent and straightened again. This is my cup. Take it now. No. He set it down and turned restlessly to Scylla. He could not say to anyone what went through his mind. Not to Scylla, not even to himself. He acted and spoke blindly. It's no good to me. We've moved on to, another thing, to other things. But it isn't stealing to take back what Mr. Light stole from you. I don't want it. What? No, I'm better off without it. I want nothing of them, neither their blood nor their silver. I'll carry that hamper for you so Mr. Light can have the old cup. But your mother, she didn't like it either. He came back when he had left the hamper and stopped by the kitchen hearth. Scylla had built up a little fire of uh, faggots to heat water. He put his two hands on the mantelpiece and his forehead on his hands. He stood like that a long time. His grandfather had built this great house. His mother had played on the floor of this kitchen. Was it where his father had come, his father, the French doctor, Dr. Latour, the Bible had had it? Here was mystery, surely. Why not Dr. Tremaine? And why had the Bible said both he and Lafina Light died of plague in Marseille, 1758, three months before he himself had been born? Does it matter? Does it? Or doesn't it? No. He answered his own question aloud and took from his pocket the heavy pages he had cut from the Bible, all written over with the names of his genealogy. He could not think now why he had ever cut them out. Slowly tearing each sheet to ribbons, he fed them to the fire upon the hearth. Then Scylla was asking him to close and fasten all the heavy shutters through the house. This would protect the interior a little bit in spite of broken window panes. His footsteps echoed through the vast, silent reaches of the house. One after another, the heavy shutters slammed to and he bolted them. A protest of unused hinges and then a bang, and he went on to the next. The echo of his own footsteps. My grandfather built this house. My mother knew it and loved it. My father dead before ever I was born. Now for as long as it stood, this would be a haunted house. He felt the ghosts waiting in darkness until he and Scylla were gone before they stepped forth to take possession. Merchant Light, soon enough he too would be back here. Miss Lafina, she might live to be a hundred, but the time would come when, will she or not, she must return to this house. This haunted house with its thin wreath of race and his mother's among them. He had seen her face, heard her voice so clearly that night. He had lain by her grave on Copse Hill. He thought of her with love and a tender understanding, understanding he had been too young to give <clears throat> when she had died. But when he left the haunted chambers, echoing halls, and went gladly to the kitchen where Scylla was, for the dead should not look at the living, nor the living too long upon the dead. Scylla, unaware of his emotions, looked about her with satisfaction. She had finished her work. Now will be good. Now will be in good order when the lights come back. Johnny felt sad. He went to her and put his arms about her and his thin cheek against her hair. 
Scylla, they won't ever come back. Never? No, this is the end. The end of one thing, the beginning of something else. They won't come back because there's going to be a war. Civil war. And we'll win. First folk like them get ro rooted out of Milton, then out of Boston, and the cards are going to be reshuffled, dealt again. Shall I shudder the kitchen too? Yes. Each time a shudder groaned, protested, and then came to with a bang. It seemed to say, this is the end. And the words echoed through the house, this is the end. This is the end. My mother played on the floor of this kitchen. My grandfather was but a young man when he built this house, and I, a grandson, had better right to it doubtless than an elder brother. The house was still filled with midnight and ghosts, but as they closed and locked the heavy kitchen door behind them, they saw it was closed upon them. It is like a funeral, Scylla whispered, only worse. So he knew that much of what he had been feeling, Scylla had also felt. Along down Old Country Road, marching through the meager half-light of the new day, came a company of Minutemen, up and out early, drilling for coming battles before it was yet the hour to get to their chores. Left, right, left, right, left. They did not march too well. A boy no bigger than Dusty Miller had put a fife to his lips, was trying to blow it. He made awkward little tootles. The men marched on past the defaced gates of the lights. Country seat, never turning to look at them, or Dr. Warren's chase with Scylla and Johnny under the hood. Oh, God help them, thought Johnny. They haven't seen those British troops in Boston. I have. They haven't seen the gold lace of the generals, those muskets, all so alike, and everyone has a bayonet. They haven't seen. The chase overtook and passed the marching farmers. That musket which Rab did not have bothered Johnny. However, the soldiers never carried them while loitering about alehouse. Uh, alehouses and wharves or the stables of the Afric Queen. They stood guard with them. They drilled with them. They practiced marksman marksmanship very badly, Rab said. And now and then, over at the foot of the common, they executed a deserter with them. But never, not once, as far as Johnny could make out, did they leave them about. Drilling, shouting, marching over, they stacked them at their barracks, and there was always at least a sergeant guarding these stacked guns. Johnny and Rab dropped their voices, even in the privacy of their attic when they discussed these muskets. The Yankee gunsmiths were working from dawn to dusk, preparing guns, making new ones, but as long as Rab had a weapon and was, after all, little more than a boy, he believed he had no chance for a modern gun unless he got it for himself from the British. How soon, Johnny whispered, before they march out and the war begins? God knows, Rab murmured. God and General Gage, maybe not until next spring. Armies always move in the spring, but before then I must have a good gun in my hands. A man can stand up to anything with a good weapon in his hands. Without it, he's but a dumb beast. Johnny had never seen Rab so blocked by anything. Apparently, he went through every situation without friction, like a knife going through cheese. Now he was blocked and it made him restless, possibly less canning. One day, he told Johnny that he had a contract with a farmer from Medway who was making a business of buying muskets from the British privates and selling them to Minutemen. Rab did not like to ask his aunt for so large a sum. She had little enough to buy food, but she, but she had said, Weapons before food. One morning, Johnny knew Rab was meeting the farmer at market. He knew that the soldier returning from guard duty was going absently, absent mind, mindedly to leave his musket on a pile of straw. It had all been worked out, but when he heard yells and shouts from the marketplace and the rattle of British drums call, calling up reserves, he tore over to Dock Square. He had a feeling that the turmoil was over Rab's gun. He was right. A solid block of redcoats faced out, presenting their muskets at the market people and inhabitants. The captain was yelling to the churning hundreds, Get back! Stand back! Good people, Boston! This is our own private affair. What's happened? Johnny asked an old hen wife. They've caught one of their own men selling a musket to a farmer. Happens he comes from Med Medway? So tis, said. Happens they caught more than the farmer and the soldier? They caught three in all. They are taking them over to the province house for General Gage. Gage is in Salem, for some colonel then. No mob gathered to rescue the two Yankees. All by now felt a certain confidence in the British way of doing things. A general, or even a colonel, had the right to punish a soldier caught selling his arms, and also anyone who tempted him. Johnny tagged the marching soldiers, but it was not until they turned into the province house that he saw the three prisoners. The British soldier was grinning, and Johnny guessed that he had been put up to this game merely to snare the yokels. The farmer was in his market smock. He had long, straight gray hair and a thin, mean mouth. 
you could tell by looking at him, he had gone into the little business for the love of money, not for the love of freedom. Rab had been shaken out of his usual nice balance between quick action and caution by his passionate desire for a good gun. Otherwise, he would not have mixed himself up with such a man. Rab himself was looking a little sullen. He was not used to defeat. What would they do to him? They might imprison him. They might flog him. Worst of all, they might turn him over to some tough top sergeant to be taught a lesson. This was, was this informal punishment would doubtless be the worst. The province house was a beautiful building, and as Johnny hung about the front of it, he had a chance to admire it for over an hour. It stood well back from the rattle and the bustle of Marble Street, with its glassy-eyed copper Indian on top of the cupola and its carved and colored lion and unicorn of Britain over the door. Behind the house, he heard orders called, and soldiers were uh, Halloween... Uh, Halloween, but worst of all, they were laughing, and that was Colonel Nesbitt's boy bringing around the colonel's charger. There was a large group of people still standing in the street. The hilarity of the British soldiers did not ease their fears as to the fate of the prisoners. Johnny could hear the rattle of the men's muskets as they came to attention, and then, altogether, four drummers let their sticks fall as one. Out onto Marble, Marlborough Street, with the drummers and black bearskin bear caps first and the colonel nesbitt on horseback came almost the entire 47th regiment surrounding a cart and the cart sat a hideous blackbird big as a man shaped like a man with head hung forward like a molting cow he was a naked man painted with tar and rolled in feathers three times already the whigs had tarred and feathered enemies and carted them through the streets of boston now it was the british turn the redcoats marched the colonel's horse pranced the cart with its shameful burden bumped over the cobbles one glance had convinced Johnny this was not Rab. The hideous blackbird had a, pa a paunch. Rab had none. Before the townhouse, Colonel Nesbitt ordered a halt, and an orderly came forward and read a proclamation. It merely explained what was being done and why, and threatened like treatment to the next buyer of stolen weapons. Then, Colonel Nesbitt was evidently a newspaper reader. The regiment went to Marshall Lane and stopped before the office of the spy. The threat was made that the editor of that paper would soon be treated like the bird in the cart. Then they were heading for Eads and Gill's office. Johnny guessed the observer would come next after the Boston Gazette and ran to Salt Lane to warn Uncle Lorne. He jumped into the shop, slamming the door after him, looking wildly about for the printer. Rab, in his printer's ap apron, was standing at his bench, quietly setting type. Rab, how'd you do it? How'd you get away? Rab's eyes glittered. In spite of his great air of calm, he was angry. Colonel Nesmith said I was just a child. Go buy a pop gun, boy, he said. They flung me out the back door, told me to go home. Then Johnny laughed. He couldn't help it. Rab had always, as far as Johnny knew, been treated as a grown man and always looked upon himself as such. So all he did was hurt your feelings? Rab grinned suddenly, but a little thinly. Johnny told of the tar and feathering of the farmer, and also that he expected in a short time the 47th Regiment would come marching down Salt Lane and stop before the door to read that proclamation about tar and feathering seditious newspaper publishers. And here they came, or, and here they come, those dressed up red monkeys, but they don't dare do anything but stop, read a proclamation, and move on. When this was over and the troops moved on down the lane to Union, Johnny and Rab stood in the street and watched them. Luckily, said Rab, I didn't give my money in advance. I'll return it to Aunt Jennifer. But he, stood, he still stood in the street watching the stiff rhythm of the marching troops, the glitter of their guns and bayonets, the dazzle of the white and scarlet disappearing at the bottom of the lane. They'll make good targets, all right, he said, absentmindedly. Out in Lexington, they are telling us, pick off the officers first, then the sergeants. Those white crosses on their chests are easy to sight on. His words frightened Johnny a little. Lieutenant Stranger, Sergeant Gale, Major Pitcairn. Johnny could not yet think of them as targets. Rab could. Back of the, of the lighthouse were apple trees, now heavy with fruit. Johnny and Scylla sat together on, bench, on a bench. He had missed her that month she had been out in Milton. It was still summer, but everywhere you could smell and feel the fall, coming of the fall. It had been an interesting conversation. Madge had run off and married Sergeant Gale, and Ma had been so put to it to keep Mr. Tweedy in the family, she had married him herself. She said she was too old for me, and she knows he's too young for her, but he's a clever smith, and she's going to hang on to him. Come hell and high water, 
Sylla bent her face over the work in her lap. She was rolling a tiny hem on a tiny handkerchief, one of Miss Lafinia's. So she's Miss, Mrs. Tweedy now. Yes, Maria Tweedy. That's not so bad. You know, you have to marry someone whose last name goes with your first. For instance, if my name was Rue, I couldn't marry a man named Barb. Or if my <clears throat> name happened to be Tobacco, I couldn't marry a man called Pouch or Pipe. Or nobody was ever named Tobacco. You don't know. If a southern merchant made a lot of money on tobacco, I thought he might name his daughter Tobacco. We make money on codfish around here, and I never heard anyone calling his girl codfish. You're just being silly. But I like to be silly. I like to plan things out. For instance, I couldn't marry a man. Anybody called Priscilla can marry anybody. No, they can't. For instance, I couldn't marry Rab. Johnny froze from being mildly irritated but interested. He was a little angry. Nobody asked you to, he said shortly. I know, but a girl has to think about things like that. Almost anything can happen to a girl suddenly, and she has to think ahead so she'll know which way to jump. Rab wouldn't marry you. He's too, he's too wonderful. Sel gave him one of her sweet, veiled glances out of the corner of her eye. That's what you mean. It was exactly what Johnny had meant. Of course not, but he's not like any other boy I ever knew. Sill did not look at the work in her idle fingers. She stared off down Beacon Hill. From where they sat, they could see the ocean. I know that, but when you get to really know him, he doesn't seem so wonderful. I mean, he's just as wonderful, but a whole lot nicer. Johnny did not want to ask the next question, but he could not help it. Have you, how'd you get to know him so well? She looked surprised. Why, he comes here and takes me walking and buys me sweets, and once he took me to Old South and to hear Dr. Warren. Rab had never said anything about this to Johnny. It was well enough to say Rab was secret, uh, was secretive by nature and couldn't help the way God had made him. But Johnny felt piqued. Scylla noticed the shadow on his face. For Scylla Silsby is poor, but Scylla Silsby is worse. Johnny's lower lip struck, stuck out, seemingly without any action of the wind. His fair hair was rumpled all over his head. But Priscilla Tremaine is a fine name, she went on. I've thought about that ever since you came to the shop, and Mother told me I had to marry you. I was eleven then. Then they had both been eleven. She a skinny little thing with a gentle face and disturbing tongue. Her clothes had always been too big for her because they were handed down from Dorcas. She had to pin her skirts tight about her waist to keep them on. Pretty and shabby and sweet and sour, Johnny had liked her right off. He had not thought much about what she looked like now, but he looked at, it, at her as she bent her face to her work. Her little pointed chin settled into the fresh white ruffles about her throat. Somehow her hair was curly around the edges and straight everywhere else. She had a shallow little nose and on either side of the bridge lay those long lashes which could mock him as well as her tongue. And so pretty he could not believe it. He was accustomed to staring at Lafina Light's famous beauty and to feel a ple pleasant tingle up and down his spine. Now it was Scylla Latham, just good old Scylla, that was giving him spinal creeps. When he was 11, he had said he would marry her if he had to, and when he was 14, he said he wouldn't take her on a gold, gold platter. He was 15 now, and soon he would be a grown-up man going courting like Rab. Scylla was packing up her sewing. Miss Lafina will be wanting her tea, and I must get a Santa dress, brush, powdered, and perfumed to sit with her. One of the soldiers off the 4th Regiment who were encamped upon the common was earning a little money helping at the light stable. As Scylla moved away from Jonna, Johnny, the groom leaped for, forward to open the kitchen door for her. Why that mannered monkey, bowing and flunking <clears throat> about because of just Scylla Latham, that red-headed parrot couldn't even talk English right. But he had known that Johnny had not. What Johnny had not, Scylla was a grown-up young lady, and she was pretty. Scylla, Johnny yelled at her, come back a moment, please. She left the groom, bowing and smirking. Yes, she said, standing before Johnny under the apple trees. Look here, what's that fellow's name? Pumpkin? That's not a name. Yes, it is. It's his. Nobody ever, no girl could be a Mrs. Pumpkin. Nobody ever? There was so long a pause, Johnny's next words sounded awkward. You were right about one thing, Priscilla Tremaine. That's a fine name. He had meant to make a joke, but as the words left his mouth, it was not. They both stood, embarrassed, looking at their feet. Scylla did not answer, but she reached up through the foliage of the tree and picked a little green apple. She gave it to him. I didn't know even winter apples were still so green, she said, and walked off toward the house without a glance for the admiring pumpkin. Johnny put the apple in his pocket. 
he'd keep it forever. It meant that Stella really thought Tremaine was a fine name. No, you can't keep even little green apples forever. It wouldn't wisen up or grow ripe, or it might rot. Human relations never seem to stand completely still. This apple, for instance, for instance, it might ripen into something better than it now was, or unromantically, it might rot away in his pocket. He put it on the window sill and a little superstitiously waited to see what it would do, but Rab ate the apple. Johnny, already jealous for the first time in his life over Rab's taking Scylla out, buying her sweets and never saying anything, tried his best to quarrel with the puzzled Rab over the, this apple. It ended as Johnny might have guessed it would. Rab refused to be impressed with his crime. All he had done was to eat a wormy, no-good apple. He'd give Johnny a peck of better ones, just so you'll stop glaring at me. Was it really wormy, Rab? It was. He had been a fool to think of the apple as a symbol of himself and Scylla. It was fall, and for the last time, Sam Adams bade Johnny summon the observers for 8 o'clock that night. After this, we will not meet again, for I believe Gage knows all about us. He might be moved to arrest Mr. Lorne. He might send soldiers to arrest us all. I hardly think they would hang the whole club, sir, and only you and Mr. Hancock. Johnny had meant this as a, for a compliment, but Sam Adams looked more startled than pleased. It has been noticed that every so often many of us are seen going up and down Salt Lane entering the printing shop. We must in the future meet in small groups, but once more and for the last time, and make as good a punch for us as you can. As Johnny went from house to house talking about unpaid bills or of eight shillings, he was thinking of the punch. Not one ship had come into Boston for five months except British ships. Only the British officers had limes, lemons, and oranges these days. They had their friends among the Boston Tories. Miss Light and God's plenty of friends among the British officers. He'd get his tropical fruit there. Mrs. Bessie listened to him. And who's going to eat these fruits or drink them if I do give you some? Well, Sam Adams for one. Don't say any more. Give me your dispatch bag, Johnny, she returned with it, bulging. No limes, though, as he eats them all. Does she, she do tricks for them like she used to for the sailors along Hancock's, war Hancock's Wharf? Tricks? Does she do tricks? Lieutenant Stranger has taught her a rigmarole about poor Nell Gwynn selling fruit at a theater. I don't need to tell you how she carries on. What happened to that cousin Seawall? Gone to Worcester. <clears throat> Joined up with the Minutemen. But he's too fat and soft. No, from now on, nobody's too fat nor soft nor old nor young. The time's coming. It would be a small meeting for all the 22 original members had already left town to get away from the threat of arrest by the British. Josiah Quincy was in England. Of the three revolutionary doctors, only Church and Warren remained. Dr. Young had gone to a safer spot. James Otis was at the moment in Boston. Johnny had notified him, although he had founded his club in the first place. Ever since he had grown so queer, the other members did not wish him about, even his lucid periods. He talked and talked. Nobody could get a word in edgewise when James Otis talked. This, the last meeting, started with the punch bowl on the table instead of the ending with it. There was no chairman, nor was there any time when the two boys were supposed to withdraw. They were talking about how Gage had a last, at last dared send out a sortie beyond the gate of Boston, and before the men and men got word of their plans, they had seized cannon and gunpowder over in Charleston, got into their boats, and back to Boston. No one's shot, no one shot had been fired, and it was all too late when the alarm had been spread and thousands of armed farmers had arrived. By then, the British were safe home again, yet Sam Adams protested. This rising up of an army of a thousand from the very soil of New England had badly frightened General Gage. Once the alarm spread that the British had left Boston, the system of all calling up the Minutemen had worked well indeed. The trouble had been in Boston itself. In other words, gentlemen, it was our fault. If we could have known but an hour, two hours in advance the British were intending, our men would have been there before the British troops arrived instead of a half hour after they left. Johnny had been told off to carry letters for the British officers to keep on good terms with their grooms and stable boys over at the Afric Queen. Somehow he had failed. He hadn't known. Nobody had known that 260 redcoats were getting into boats, slipping off up the mystic, seizing Yankee gunpowder, and rowing it back to Castle Island for themselves. Paul Revere was saying, We must organize a better system of watching their movements, but in such a way that they will not realize they are being watched. Sam and Job, John Adams were standing, and the other members were crowding about them, shaking hands with them, wishing them success at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. 
They were starting the next day. Everyone was ready to give them advance advice on whom to see, what to say, or to prophesy the outcome of this Congress. Paul Revere and Joseph Warren were apart a little, making plans for that spy system which was needed badly. They called Johnny to them, but he could hear one of them, one man standing about the two Adamses, saying, But there must be some hope we can still patch up our differences with England. Sir, you will work for peace? Sam Adams said nothing for a moment. He trusted these men about him as he trusted no one else in the world. No, that time has passed. I will work for war. The complete freedom of these colonies from any European power. We can have that freedom only by fighting for it. God grant we fight soon. For 10 years we've tried this and we've tried that. We've tried to placate them and they to placate us. Gentlemen, you know it has not worked. I will not work for peace. Peace, peace, and there is no peace. But I will, in Philadelphia, play a cautious part, not throw all my cards on the table. Oh no, but nevertheless, I will work for but one thing, war, bloody and terrible death and destruction. But out of it shall come such a country as was never seen on this earth before. We will fight. There was a heavy footstep across the floor of the shop below. Rab leaped to the leader's ladder's head. James Otis, he reported to the men standing about Adams. Well, said Sam Adams, a little crossly, no one needs stay and listen to him. He shot his bolt years ago, still talking about the natural rights of man and the glories of the British Empire. You and I, John, had as well go home and get a good night's sleep before leaving at dawn tomorrow. Otis pulled his bulk up uh, up the ladder. If no one was glad to see him, at least no one was so discourteous as to leave. Mr. Otis was immediately shown every honor, given a comfortable armchair and a tankard of punch. Seemingly, he was not in a talkative mood tonight. The broad, ruddy, good-natured face turned left and right, nodding casually to his friends, taking it for granted that he was still a great man among them, instead of a milestone they all believed they had passed years before. He sniffed at his punch and sipped a little. Sammy, he said to Sam Adams, my coming in interrupted something you were saying? We will fight? You had got that far? Well, yes, that's no secret. For what will we fight? To free Boston from these infernal redcoats and... No, said Otis. Boy, give me more punch. That's not enough reason for going into a war. Did any occupied city ever have better treatment than we've had from the British? Has one rebellious newspaper been stopped? One treasonable speech? Where are, where are the firing squads, the jails jammed with political prisoners? What about the gallows for you, Sam Adams, and you, John Hancock? It has never been set up. I hate those infernal British troops spread all over my town as much as you do. Can't move these days without stepping on a soldier. But we are not going off into a civil war merely to get them out of Boston. Why are we going to fight? Why? Why? There was an embarrassed silence. Sam Adams was the acknowledged ringleader. It was for him to speak now. We will fight for the rights of Americans. England cannot take our money away by taxes. No, no, for something more important than the pocketbooks of our American citizens, Rab said. For the rights of Englishmen everywhere. Why stop with Englishmen? Otis was warming up. He had a wide mouth, crooked, crooked and generous. He settled back in his chair and then he began to talk. It was such talk as Johnny had never heard before. The words surged up through the big body, flowed out of the broad mouth. He never raised his voice, and he went on and on. Sometimes Johnny felt so intoxicated by the mere sound of the words that he, had, that he hardly followed the sense. That soft, low voice flowed over him, submerged him. For men and women and children all over the world, he said, You were right, you tall, dark boy, for even as we shoot down the British soldiers, we are fighting for rights such as they will be enjoying a hundred years from now. There shall be no more tyranny. A handful of men cannot seize power over thousands. A man shall choose who it is shall rule over them. The peasants of France, the serfs of Russia, hardly more than animals now, but because we fight, they shall see freedom like a new sun rising in the west. Those natural rights God has given to every man, no matter how humble, he smiled suddenly and said, or crazy, and took a good pull of his tankard. The battle we win over the worst in England shall benefit the best in England. How well are they over there represented when it comes to taxes? Not very well. It will be better for them when we have won this war. Will French peasants go on forever pulling off their caps and saying, We, oui, Monsieur, <clears throat> when the gold coaches run down their children, they will not. Italy and all those German states, are they nothing but soldiers? Will no one show them the rights of good citizens? So we hold up our torch and do not forget it was lighted upon the fires of England, and we will set it as a new sun to lighten a world. Sam Adams, Sam Adams, anxious to get the good night's sleep before starting the next day for Philadelphia, was smiling slightly, nodding his gray head, 
seeming to agree. He was bored. It does not matter. He was thinking what James Otis says these days, sane or crazy. Joseph Warren's fair, respons responsive face was aflame. The torch Otis had been talking about seemed reflected in his eyes. We are lucky men, he murmured, for we have a cause worth dying for. This honor is not given to every generation. Boy, said Otis Johnny, fill my tankard. It was not until he had drained it and wiped his mouth on the back of his hand that he spoke again. All sat silently waiting for him. He had, and not for the first time, cast a spell upon them. They say, he began again, my wits left me after I got hit on the head by that customs official. That's what you think, eh, Mr. Sam Adams? Oh, no, no, indeed, Mr. Otis. Some of us will give our wits, he said. Some of us all our property. Hey, John Hancock, did you hear that? Property. That hurts, eh? To give one silver wine coolers, one's coach and four, and the gold buttons of one's sprigged satin waistcoats? Hancock looked him straight in the face, and Johnny had never before liked him so well. I am ready, he said. I can get along without all of that. You, Paul Revere, you'll give up that silver craft you love. God made you to make silver, not war. Revere smiled. There's a time for the casting of silver and a time for the casting of a cannon. If that's not in the Bible, it should be. Dr. Warren, you have a young family. You know quite well. If you get killed, they may literally starve, Warren said. I thought of all that long ago. And you, John Adams, you've built up a very nice little law practice, stealing away my clients, I notice. Ah, well, so it goes. Each shall give according to his own abilities, and some, he turned directly to Rab, some will give their lives, all the years of their maturity, all the children they never lived to have, the serenity of old age. Old age. To die so young is more than merely dying. It is to lose so large a part of life. Rab was looking straight at Otis. His arms were folded across his chest, his head flung back a little, his lips parted as though he would speak, but he did not. Even you, my old friend, my old enemy, how shall I call you? Sam Adams? Even you will give the best you have, a genius for politics. Oh, go to Philadelphia. Pull all the wool, pull all the strings and all the wires. Yes, go, go. And God go with you. We need you, Sam. We must fight this war. You'll play your part, but what is it really about? You'll never know. James Otis was on his feet, his head close against the rafters that cut down into the attic, making it the shape of a tent. Otis put out his arms. It is all so much simpler than you think, he said. He lifted his hands and pushed against the rafters. We give all we have, lives, property, property, safety, skills. We fight, we die for a simple thing, only that a man can stand up. With a curt nod, he was gone. Johnny was standing close to Rab. It had frightened him when Mr. Otis had said, some will give their lives and look straight at Rab, die so that a man can stand up. Once more, Sam Adams had the center of attention. He was again buttoning up his coat, preparing to leave, but first he turned to Revere. Now he is gone. We can talk a moment about that spy system you think you can organize in Boston. Paul Revere, like his friend, Joseph Warren, was slight, still slightly under the spell of James Otis. I had never thought about it that way before, he, he said, not answering Sam Adams' words. You know, my father had to flee France because of the tearing over there. He was only a child, but now in a way, I'm fighting for that child. That no frightened lost child ever is sent out a refuge from his own country because of race or religion. Then he pulled himself together and answered Sam Adams' remarks about the spy system. That night, when the boys were both in bed, Johnny heard Rab, usually a heavy sleeper, turning and turning. Johnny, he said at last, are you awake? Yes. What was it, he said? That a man can stand up. Rab sighed and stopped turning. In a few moments, he was asleep. As often had happened before, it was a younger boy who lay wide awake, wide-eyed in the darkness. That a man can stand up. He never forget Otis with his hands pushed up against the cramp cramping rafters over his head. That a man can stand up. As simple as that. And the strange new sun rising in the west. A sun that was to illumine a world to come.